Hello everyone, this is Mr. Millette with an AP World History presentation. Today's presentation is all about networks of exchange in pre-modern world history. This is also the first of our lectures for Unit 2, Networks of Exchange. This presentation and the next several are over topics that are still within the 1200 to 1450 time period. That is period one of this AP World History course. You will recognize many of the civilizations, cultural and economic developments, and technologies from the presentations from Unit 1, The Global Tapestry, in these presentations for Unit 2. Unit 2, Networks of Exchange, attempts to present the interconnectedness of pre-modern civilizations through various networks of exchange. Sometimes referred to as merely trade routes, these networks of exchange have a lot more complexity to the interactions and exchanges made than just merely the trade of goods. These networks of exchange were also characterized by cultural, intellectual, religious, and biological exchanges in addition to economic exchanges. More specifically, this presentation will focus on arguably the most historically recognizable network of exchange from pre-modern world history the Silk Roads. By the end of this presentation, you will be expected to be able to demonstrate your understanding of these three learning objectives. One, explain the causes and effects of the growth of networks of exchange after 1200. Number two, explain the intellectual and cultural effects of the various networks of exchange in Afro-Eurasia from 1200 to 1450, and three, explain the environmental effects of the various networks of exchange in Afro-Eurasia from 1200 to 1450. The Silk Road was a network of pre-modern imperial roads, thoroughfares, and trails that integrated many civilizations of the Eurasian landmass. In pre-modern times, no merchant, missionary, diplomat, soldier, nor emperor would have referred to this network as the Silk Road, as the term is really an historiographical term that was created by historians to capture the essence of this complex pre-modern network of exchange. The Silk Road was also not just a single roadway or pathway that ran horizontally across Eurasia like a modern day interstate system. It would have been highly unlikely for a merchant or any other traveler to have the ability to access the entirety of the Silk Road as compared to modern day American motorists taking Interstate 10, for example, across the southern portion of the United States from Jacksonville, Florida to Los Angeles, California. Rather, most travelers of the Silk Road tended to travel within local increments. This was especially so for merchants who spent more of their time peddling goods in the markets of border towns rather than traveling long distances that would have cost them time, money, and resources with high risk of financial loss. It was much more beneficial to the merchants' day-to-day -day activity to work within the local marketplaces of their nationality. However, this is not to say that no merchants ever made the trek from Europe to China. They certainly did make that trek. And those journeys are thoroughly documented in historical records throughout classical and post-classical times. More historically documented than merchants crossing national borders was the international travel of diplomats and missionaries along the Silk Roads. It was much more common for diplomats and missionaries to cross national borders than for merchants to do so, since they had specific orders or goals that necessitated their visitations to foreign lands. The Silk Road's earliest point of integration was likely during the prosperous times of the coexisting Han Dynasty of China and the Roman Empire of the Mediterranean Basin, during the late classical period. However, the Persians and the Macedonians contributed to the integration of Eurasia much earlier than Han China and the Roman Empire with the building of roads, such as Persia's Royal Road, 
and the expansion of empire and urban development like that of the Hellenistic Empire. Chronologically, economic and cultural activity along the Silk Road declined considerably after the fall of the classical empires. The old network became a difficult and dangerous process for courageous travelers until imperial systems were revitalized and reorganized in the post-classical period. Additionally, technologies, urban development, and imperial systems, which were all furthered in the post-classical period, enabled a revitalization of the Silk Road and its unprecedented economic, technological, cultural, and environmental impact on human societies. The Silk Road was quite a human feat in that its complexity and intricacy was necessary to defeat the rough and rugged terrain of the Eurasian landmass. Comparable to the terrestrial difficulties of covered wagon pioneers along the Santa Fe or Oregon trails of 19th century North America, mobile peoples of the post-classical period succeeded in traversing the arduous geography of Eurasia. The roadways meandered through the semi-arid steppe lands of Central Asia, where Turkish and Mongolian peoples survived. The roadways oftentimes plowed through the unforgiving heat and dryness of the Syrian, Arabian, and Gobi deserts. One desert travelers purposefully avoided was China's Taklamakan Desert, as it was a death trap to those who dared to venture across. China's Tang Dynasty built northern and southern roads that circumvented the Taklamakan Desert so as to spare the lives of merchants, missionaries, diplomats, and soldiers traveling abroad. If the deserts and steppe lands were not arduous enough, the Hindu Kush and Himalayan mountain ranges of Central Asia definitely posed a geographic obstacle to travelers across the terrain. Mountain passes, such as the Khyber Pass of the Hindu Kush Mountains, enabled travelers to move between modern-day Afghanistan and Pakistan. In essence, without the Silk Road, which was possible through pre-modern human ingenuity, the Eurasian landmass would not have been environmentally conquered as it was in pre-modern times. One reason for the Silk Road's post-classical revitalization was the resurgence of strong empires during that time. For example, the Byzantine Empire, the Abbasid Caliphate, and the Tang Dynasty of China expanded their imperial rule and military protection of Eurasian lands. In addition, their imperial rule and military presence added more road systems and military outposts, which provided far more protection to travelers than in earlier times. Though none of these three empires truly came to permanently dominate the Eurasian interior and peoples of Central Asia, the apex of imperial expansion and military protection came during the reign of the Mongolian Empire and its subsequent Mongolian kingdoms in the late post-classical period. The Pax Mongolica, or the Mongolian Peace, which was established in the late post-classical period, was a case of the once barbaric bandit Mongols having become the protectors of the roads and its travelers via the defense against barbarians and bandits along the Silk Road. State building on the periphery of major empires, such as the Turkish states, like the Seljuk states of Southwest Asia, and the Sultanate of Delhi of South Asia, also contributed to the economic and political stability necessary for travel along the Silk Road. These states and empires maintained and developed imperial roads that were organized, protected, and fortified with checkpoints and courier relay points. These pieces of infrastructure and imperial services contributed to the increase of travel and exchange along the Silk Road. In some cases, these empires established inns for Silk Road travelers known as caravansaries. Caravansaries were almost like motels on modern day interstates, 
but were equipped to manage the travelers, cargo, and transport animals used in travel across the Silk Road. These caravanseries led to the establishment of oasis towns in places where urban development was virtually impossible in earlier times. For example, the oasis towns of Dunhuang in the Gobi Desert of China and Kashgar near the Taklamakan Desert in China became destinations for merchants and missionaries traveling the arduous terrain. In some of these oasis towns, great market economies were formed and marketplaces and bazaars in Central Asia became places of great cultural and economic exchange. However, the most significant places that made the Silk Road function were the major trading cities of Eurasia, to include Constantinople in modern-day Turkey, Damascus in modern-day Syria, Jerusalem in modern-day Israel, Baghdad in modern-day Iraq, Tabriz and Isfahan in modern-day Iran, Kabul in modern-day Afghanistan, Erjinj, Samarkand, and Bukhara in modern-day Uzbekistan, Taksila in modern-day Pakistan, Delhi and Agra in modern-day India, Kanbalik and Chang'an in modern-day China, and Karakoram in modern-day Mongolia. These trading cities offered large and lucrative markets, large and diverse urban populations, culture and infrastructure, and enhanced urban lifestyles for travelers who were essentially magnetized by these places. New and improved commercial practices contributed to an increase in the volume of trade, which also expanded the geographical range of the Silk Road. For example, methods of paper currency were utilized by many civilizations and trading cities. Paper currency was more efficient and available than coin or shell currency. Additionally, paper currency was safer and easier to travel with than traditional coin and shell currency. Coin and shell currency may have enabled greater amounts of economic exchange beyond simple bartering economies but paper currency took economic exchange to an entirely new level. China was the first to produce paper, and so, incidentally, it was the first place to establish methods of paper currency. During the Tang Dynasty, the paper notes were referred to as flying cash, as banks and lenders of different Chinese cities and markets recognized and honored deposits and withdrawals for merchants who carried paper notes and account ledgers to prove their financial standing. It was given the name flying cash since money seemed to move swiftly and easily in a paper form. Eventually, during the Song Dynasty, paper currency was standardized and regulated by the Chinese government. The Abbasid Caliphate also upgraded its banking and paper currency methods. The SAC, which was an Abbasid paper note worked similar to China's flying cash, as Islamic merchants from the vast Abbasid Empire made exchanges in the different markets of the major trading cities. These improved commercial and financial practices certainly enabled more merchant activity and the increase in the division of crops, luxury goods, and technologies during the late post-classical period. Technology was also a contributing factor to the Silk Road's increased frequency of travel and exchange. Draft animals such as horses, donkeys, mules, and camels have enabled humans to perform laborious tasks. These particular draft animals are best suited for transportation of people and their cargo. Though domestication of these animals predate the post-classical period, their utility and effectiveness greatly increase travel and exchange along the Silk Road. Horses, which are best suited for traveling fast. Camels, though slow, are best suited for traveling long distances. And donkeys and mules are best suited for traveling in high altitudes. These animals made it possible for merchants, missionaries, diplomats, and armies to traverse the varied terrain of the Eurasian landmass. Additionally, 
saddles, yokes, carts, stirrups, horseshoes, and horse collars enable these draft animals to move more efficiently, cooperatively, and safely in large caravans across the unforgiving terrain. The fleeting diffusion of economic, cultural, and technological advancements in pre-modern times was certainly owed to these beasts of burden and the human ingenuity that went into capitalizing on their muscle power and natural physical attributes. As Eurasia's political and economic elites increased their demand of luxury goods, Chinese, Persian, and Indian artisans and merchants expanded their production of those luxury goods. Textiles, such as Chinese silk and Indian cotton, traversed the Eurasian landmasses along the Silk Road. Chinese porcelain and paper, produced for export, also made their way across the landmass. However, the Silk Road was not just responsible for the diffusion of scarce luxury items, but it was also instrumental in the diffusion of the production techniques of some luxury items. For example, during the 6th century CE, as the Byzantine Empire was on the rise during the long and prosperous reign of Emperor Justinian, the knowledge of Chinese sericulture, or silk making, was studied and learned by Byzantine textile manufacturers. Justinian ordered the smuggling of Chinese silkworms into Constantinople so as to increase the amount of silk available to the upper class of Byzantium and to mobilize silk production in the western half of the Eurasian landmass. Typically, silk had made its way into Constantinople by the peddling of Persian and Sogdian merchants from Iran who had initially received the silk from Tibetan and Chinese merchants. It is historically debatable as to the process that was employed to smuggle the silkworms into Constantinople. But one thing that is historically defensible was the Western monopoly the Byzantines would have on silk production until the time of the 13th century. Another luxury item whose production had remained a Chinese monopoly and a tightly protected secret was papermaking. Papermaking was invented by the Chinese during the rule of the Han Dynasty in the Classical period. The Han Dynasty was a contemporary of the Roman Empire and of the earliest exchanges along the Silk Road between Chang'an and Rome, paper was included in those luxury exchanges. The secret of Chinese papermaking would last longer than the classical empires that initiated its production and diffusion. However, into the post-classical period, with the resurgence of empire in China during the time of the Tang Dynasty, and the reorganization of political landscapes of the Middle East with the success of the Abbasid Caliphate, the unclaimed space between the eastern and western portions of the Asian landmass shrunk to merely the Talas River in modern-day Kyrgyzstan and Kazakhstan in Central Asia. The relatively new Abbasid Caliphate had expanded deeper into Central Asia and controlled most of the territory west of the Talas River. Additionally, the Tang Dynasty had expanded deeper into Central Asia and controlled most of the territory east of the Talas River. With two imperialistic states seeking control of the heartland of the Silk Road, the Abbasids and the Tang Dynasty would clash at the Battle of Talas River in 751 CE. The Abbasids would take Chinese and Tibetan prisoners of war to the city of Samarkand in nearby modern-day Uzbekistan. It was there in Samarkand that the war captives would instruct the Abbasid military on the technique of Chinese papermaking. Papermaking became a common practice in the Abbasid Caliphate for the next five centuries and would be adopted by other nearby civilizations over the course of the post-classical period. In effect, Travel and exchange along the Silk Road led to the expansion of market economies, such as Muslim bazaars and oasis towns and trading cities. Additionally, 
the diffusion and adoption of new financial practices and instruments like paper money and check writing became common practice in Eurasian civilizations. The Silk Road also led to the integration of Asian societies with Mediterranean cities and societies, including Italian port cities such as Venice. This, in turn, allowed for an increase of luxury goods into European society during the High Middle Ages and contributed to the demographic and urban development in Southern Europe. The Silk Road also contributed to the diffusion of religions such as Buddhism, Christianity, and Islam. Buddhist communities founded in Dunhuang, China, and Christian communities founded in Western China, and Islamic mosques constructed within Muslim communities in Central Asia and as far east as Chang'an, all serve as architectural and anthropological evidence to the Silk Road's cultural influence. Lastly, the Silk Road's rate and speed of travel and exchange led to the severe outbreak of bubonic plague around 1350 CE, and in turn, it left negative demographic and economic consequences, such as nearly one-third population loss in Eurasian civilizations, urban population decline, labor shortages, decline in production, and the decline in local and long-distance commerce. Though locally the vestiges of the Silk Road still exist in parts of Central Asia today, the intricate and interregional system that peaked in post-classical times waned as the early modern period emerged. The terrestrial travel that dominated post-classical travel and exchange would bow to the new transoceanic maritime routes that were being established in the late 15th century. Being that this is our first in-depth look at a pre-modern network of exchange, it is difficult to begin making parallels, comparisons, and contrasts with other pre-modern networks of exchange. However, the next two presentations will be about two other networks of exchange from pre-modern times. I'd like for students to begin preparing for those presentations by taking their knowledge of the reasons for the establishment of the Silk Road, reasons for the Silk Road's growth, and the Silk Road's economic, cultural, environmental, and demographic effects on pre-modern civilizations learned in this presentation, and look for those same aspects in the presentations on the Indian Ocean Complex and the Trans-Sahara Trade Route.